I have so enjoyed spending time with you. I love meeting new sisters that I didn't even know I had before. And now you mean a lot to me. And thank you for inviting me to Maine. Maine is beautiful this time of year. Everybody said you missed it, but I don't think I missed it. It's beautiful. Um, in the Philippines, we didn't have seasons like we do here. It's always tropical, hot and humid, and pretty much rains every day. Uh, since we lived near the equator, the sun would rise and go down basically the same time every day. Not much of a dusk. So it's light one minute and dark the next. So to have long days in the summer and then short days and fall colors and the cool of changing seasons is really, really neat. Several years ago in our house in Rose Hill, I started seeing little pumpkin pictures stuck all over the house. I went into the bathroom one night and there was a smiley face um, pumpkin picture stuck to my mirror and it said pumpkin patch on it and I didn't think it was Zachary sticking up uh, pumpkins all over the house and Jeff was away at Liberty University. So I asked Mindy about it and she informed me that she had never in 18 years of life been to a pumpkin patch and she wanted to go. Well just to defend myself, we didn't have fall and there were no pumpkin patches overseas. So we found a pumpkin patch and a corn maze that we went to. She found the perfect pumpkin. It was a big one that we paid way too much for. And we spent an hour or so in the maze after dark. We weren't smart enough to buy the pumpkin after we went through the maze. And Mary, uh, Mindy carried the pumpkin all evening long. I carry it for a while, Zach took a turn because we always, we were feeling bad for her. As we took wrong turns and got lost and hit, hit dead ends and had to ask other lost people where to go at times in the corn maze, I got to thinking that that's how life is sometimes. We wonder where we went wrong because we end up somewhere that we didn't think we were going. Uh, we thought we were making a good choice back at that fork. And I'm so glad that our family knows the one who knows the way through the maze. He's there to navigate the dead ends. He gives us strength when we've lost our way, peace when we don't like the path that we're on. And he knows the end from the beginning, and we're so happy to have him. And we can trust him with our lives. So how I love the fall. And every fall I look back on things that have changed during the year. Have things changed for you since last fall? I bet you've been through some things that um, you never would have imagined. And God's been faithful to you. Or maybe you feel that he hasn't been especially good and faithful to you. You might have issues with the Lord right now. Do you know what? God knows and he understands your thoughts and how you feel. The neat thing about our God is that he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities because he himself has been through trials like ours when he walked this earth as one of us. He laid aside his glory and he became lowly. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 puts it this way. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we'll receive his mercy, and we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. And I hope that our time together will encourage you to keep going, through good times and through bad times. I hope it will encourage you that at the end of the trial, there is going to be good, even if you don't see it right now. And as I look back on this year, since last fall, my parents passed away within days of each other last November. Uh, my dad always said that he couldn't live without my mom, and he was right. <laughs> he died a week after mom's funeral. That's coming up on a year ago. And then just hours after dad's funeral, 
my daughter and her family moved from Kansas to Florida to be involved in ministry near Tampa. And I already had a son in Orlando, so seven grandchildren in Florida and no parents to care for in Kansas anymore. So I packed up and I moved to Florida. Just a snap decision, sort of. I live in a little village built by the man who started Tropicana Orange Juice. He immigrated to the United States from Sicily, from Italy, uh, went through Ellis Island in New York in the early 1900s with $30 in his pocket. He was a Catholic in faith. He made his way to Florida where one day he was in a public library and someone had left a copy of the book uh, Life of Christ sitting on the table. He picked it up and sat there and read it. Then he read it again. And by the time he finished the second time through, he had put his faith in Christ as his personal savior. And he was very interested in his whole family and all his friends knowing the Lord became very evangelistic. In Florida, Mr. Rossi saw the many orange groves. And back then, only the big, beautiful oranges were sold in gift boxes. And the small oranges that didn't look good were often just discarded. And he thought there must be something that can be done with these plain little oranges. And he made orange juice from them, began sending them back up to his friends in New York, and the rest is history. You've all seen Tropicana orange juice in your grocery store. Mr. Rossi soon became aware that there were missionaries and um, missionaries who spent their lives overseas, came back to America when they were old and they had no place to retire. So he built a village for retired missionaries and pastors. When it first was built, the missionaries lived there free. It's in Bradenton, uh, Florida. Uh, missionaries lived there free, and he fed them three meals a day in the little dining hall. Of course, things have changed since then, but Il Villaggio is a community for missionaries, pastors, anyone in full-time Christian work. Uh, like-minded people in a beautiful village, and that's where I am. And I have to drive a little ways to see my kids, but I feel safe there. And they're allowing me to live there even though I'm not retired. So here it is, autumn, and you know what? I'm back in the tropics in Florida, hot and humid, much like the Philippines. They say that you know it's, it's autumn in Florida when the colors start to change on the license plates because all the retired snowbirds are coming from the north um, so hopefully you thought of some questions we'll try to get to some Q&A here in just a little bit uh, Martin and I were members of New Tribes Mission for um, 17 years uh, Ethnos 360 is the name now Ethnos ethnicities people groups 360, the 360 degree circle around the world. And working in hard places is what Ethnos 360 does. For 75 years, Ethnos 360 has been working in isolated villages and there's still a lot to do. The job has to be done. The last tribe, the last man. And we need quality people who know the scriptures to help take the gospel there. And I have to wonder if in a group this large, if God might be touching some hearts to do a special work. God's always picked a certain people to do a difficult work. I don't have to convince you with this job because God's going to pick some of you. Do you have the faith, the courage, the urging to say, um, yes, uh, God, you want to use my life. You want to use me to make a difference in the world. A long-term sign-me-up difference. Not to go on a short-term mission trip, but a lifelong career missionary. And to some of you, God will answer, yes, that's what we have for you. You might be saying, you know what? Um, I'm not in the position to go right now, this stage of my life. I just want to remind you that you can have a worldwide ministry with any people group that you choose without ever leaving your living room. Because you can pray. When we pray, God works.
pray, pray, pray. Ethnos 360 needs prayer partners. Pick up one of the leaflets from the back and go on their website. They have, I think, daily prayer requests for you. Maybe God would touch your heart to pray for Muslims. A sweet Mennonite lady once, after I talked, came to me and said, um, You know, Gracia, uh, when I can't fall asleep at night, I don't count sheep anymore. I count Muslims. One Muslim comes to Jesus. Two Muslims come to Jesus. Three Muslims come to Jesus. Oh, Lord, may it be so for your honor and for your glory. Four Muslims come to Jesus. You have heard that Muslims all over the world are coming to Jesus. Have you heard that? My friend from Iran says, it's like God is running a special on Muslims right now. The fastest growing Christian church in the world is in Iran. Does that surprise you? Afghanistan is a close second. And I wonder if what's happening in the Muslim world right now is a direct answer to some Mennonite lady's prayer of faith when she can't sleep at night. So you can pray. We can all be strategically involved in reaching the world with the gospel. Ask God, what would you have me to do at my age, at my stage of life? And he will answer. He'll give you a job to do. Several years ago, my kids started begging me to go back to the Philippines for a visit. Um, I'd been told that the kids needed closure. Um, I didn't even know what closure was. But I had been back a few months before to testify against eight members of the Abu Sayyaf that are held in a Manila prison. I traveled with the FBI. I wore bulletproof vests. We drove around in bulletproof cars. I lived in a secure compound at the embassy. There was the media frenzy. The Philippine paparazzi were everywhere the whole time. You would have thought I was Jessica Simpson. <laughs> After that trip, I thought, can I go back and just be me? Can I take the kids for a visit? Uh, would we just be hounded by the press? So we decided as a family that we would sneak back to the Philippines. We wouldn't tell anyone in the United States that we were going. We wouldn't tell anyone in the Philippines that we were coming. And word wouldn't get out to the press. So a few days before Christmas, several years ago, we left. Our first stop was Chicago. And that's where I made Jeff change his FCA t-shirt that said Burnham on the back. We were sneaking. Like, how had, my, how had I missed that? It was also in Chicago that I went into the bathroom and I put on this ridiculous-looking wig because it's in Chicago that Filipinos start joining the flight to Manila. Um, it was a good thing I wore this disguise, the leg from... Japan to Manila, I sat by a very talkative Filipino man. Uh, the kids and I, for some reason, had gotten scattered all over the plane. We, we weren't sitting together. So this guy asked me my family name. Well, I didn't have a good lie planned. I'd gone to all this trouble, and I didn't know what to say. So I hemmed and I hawed, and um, finally I said, well, it's Burnham. Burnham, he said. I remember a few years back, there was a couple named the Burnhams. They were taken by the Abu Sayyaf. I think they were with the Peace Corps. And he told our sad story. Yeah, Gracia Burnham, he said. I said, you know, I've heard of her. <laughs> and then... I grabbed a pillow and told him I was really tired and I slept the rest of the way to Manila so I didn't have to answer any more of his questions. And we got to Manila and I was worrying because at this point my passport didn't look anything like me and Jeff said, Mom, don't worry. If I were an immigration officer and you were next in line, I would think I need to stamp her passport quick because her biker husband is right behind her and I don't want to get hurt. So we got out, uh, out of the airport okay. We hired a van and a driver and drove 
all night up to where we used to live. And we remembered why we loved it. All our old friends and our neighbors were there. We played soccer and rugby. We played Risk and Monopoly, hiked mountains, sat around the campfire at night singing, and I watched the kids get closure. And I still don't know what it is, but I watched them just relax like they hadn't since their dad's death. Just a few weeks before we arrived, a typhoon had hit the Philippines and caused a lot of um, flash flooding and mudslides. And so Sunday morning after we got there, I went to the market and I bought food, all sorts of food, canned goods, milk packets, coffee, sugar, tins of fish, rice. We put it in big plastic tubs like Filipinos use to do their laundry in. And the afternoon of Sunday, we went to um, the area of devastation that was just a few kilometers down the road to give out the food to flood victims. These were people that had almost nothing before the flood. And now they had even less. And in each house, we heard stories of loss. One man had lost his wife and his two boys. He found her body two days down river. He never found the boys. And he w as he was walking away that day towards the little shack that he had rebuilt, he realized that he I realized he was going home to an empty house. There was no one to even share the food with. And my heart went out to these people, and we stood and sang Christmas songs to them, and they were surprised to see me. And we told them we loved them, but more importantly, God loves you. And Jesus came to take care of your sin problem. As we drove home that day, I couldn't get that man who'd lost his wife out of my mind, and I just constantly prayed for him that, God would somehow comfort his heart. During our time there, our New Tribes Mission Field Conference rolled around. Field Conference is when all the missionaries come out of their tribal villages, and we all meet together for a week of encouragement and fun. And that year, we were meeting at the Word of Life camp. What I hadn't realized is that all our co-workers needed closure as well. They need to needed to see our family, see that we were okay, hear the stories of God's goodness, and that we'd moved on with life. One afternoon, we had some free time, and I decided to sit on my bed in our little cabin and read my Bible. I began reading Isaiah 40, and it begins with the words, Comfort my people. I had just been asking God to comfort this flood victim, so my ears perked up to see how God planned to comfort his people. The chapter speaks about God's greatness. Who else has held the ocean in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed out the mountains and the hills? We had just been on a 14-hour flight from Chicago to Narita, Tokyo. We would traveled at 37,000 feet. According to the flight map that you can watch to see your progress along the way, the outside temperature was negative 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And I had to think, man has done a pretty good job here. Here we are crossing the Pacific Ocean in a huge plane with over 300 people and all their stuff aboard, uh, watching movies, eating hot meals, Having a pleasant time, man has really used his brain to accomplish something. But look at what God did. He made the ocean that it took us 14 hours to fly across. Let's put that ocean, the Pacific and the Atlantic and the South China Sea and the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean, name them all. Let's put them all together. And in God's hands, there are little droplet that he can hold or drop out if he wishes. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? God's greatness. Then it talks about God's wisdom. 
Who's able to advise the Spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to be his teacher or counselor? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good and what is best? No. For all the nations of the world are nothing in comparison to him. They're but a drop in the bucket, dust on the scales. He picks up the islands as though they had no weight at all. The nations of the world are as nothing to him. In his eyes, they're less than nothing. More of God's wisdom. Have you never heard or understood? Are you deaf to the words of God, the words he gave before the world began? Are you so ignorant? It's God who sits above the circle of the earth. The people below must seem to him like grasshoppers. He's the one who spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent from them. He judges the great people of the world and he brings them all to nothing. We can't question the greatness or the wisdom of God. God does what God wants to do because he's God. And many of us here prayed that Martin would come home from his ordeal with terrorists. We prayed fervently. We prayed in faith, believing that God would answer in the affirmative. Could God have gotten Martin home alive? Certainly. We've seen his power. You mean he chose for Martin to lose his life? Certainly, or it wouldn't have happened. Is anything wrong with that? Certainly not. God is God, and we bow down and we worship him when we see who he really is. And then I started thinking about problems. People say to me, um, here's my problem. Oh, it, it's nothing like yours. I hear that all the time. Nothing like yours. Since when do we categorize problems? You know, this one's small, this one's big. A trial is a trial is a trial. And your trial is every bit as significant as mine because it's yours. It's what you're dealing with right now. And it was about then that a fight broke out in the barrio just a few yards from our cabin. It was fiesta time, which means everybody drinks too much. The Word of Life camp, the camp is a big semicircle, and all around the outside of the cabins, just outside the fence that borders the property, a barrio has grown up. A barrio is a community or a little town. The houses were built right up against the fence, and it wasn't much of a fence, a rickety bamboo stick fence ready to fall down. Anyway, at least two guys were drunk and began fighting in the barrio not far away, and it went on and on and on, and there was yelling and screaming and bottles breaking, and soon I could tell by the noise that the whole barrio had joined in. The shouting was in Tagalog, and I don't speak Tagalog, and I got very uneasy, so much so that I finally went to the only window in the cabin that opens up to the barrio, and I stepped up on the toilet, and I looked out there to see what was going on, and my uneasy feeling even just got worse as I watched people trying to restrain those guys who looked like they were going to kill each other. I was waiting for the shooting to start any minute. I went into the other room where Martin's sister, Cheryl, was sitting on her bed reading, Cheryl and her husband, Walt, are missionaries in the Philippines. Ma uh, Walt teaches at Faith Academy, one of the largest, I think the largest MK school, boarding school for missionary children in the world. And I asked Cheryl, can you call 911 in the Philippines? Without looking up, very nonchalant, she said, uh, only if you want to order pizza. I said, you're kidding, right? And she said, no. No, the, the number to order pizza is 911-1111. And I decided I was being way too American about this fight. And I went back to studying. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Asked the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out one after another, calling each by its name. And he counts them to see that none are lost or have strayed away. O oh, Israel, how do you say the Lord does not see your troubles? 
How can you say God refuses to hear your case? We think of our problems, and do we doubt that God will answer our prayers? Do you think he's too busy to be concerned about the smallest detail of your life? Do you think he's forgotten that man in Bambang who lost his family in the flood? Do you think that he has concern for your life, for your husband, for your lack of one, for your trouble? Remember, the whole chapter begins with the Lord saying, Comfort my people. The times I fail to be comforted are the times when I turn and I look at my problem and my back is towards God, and my problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it starts sending fingers and tentacles into my whole life, and God's back there, and he's gotten very small. I want to encourage us to turn to God. Have you never heard or understood? Don't you know the Lord is the everlasting God? the creator of all the earth. He never grows faint or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to those who are tired and worn out. He offers strength to the weak. When we make an about face and we look at God's greatness and we bow down and we worship him, God becomes very big in our lives, and we look back at that problem, and it's not the mountain it was before. The end of chapter 40, even youths will become exha exhausted, and young men will give up, but those that wait on the Lord will find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Notice there's a weight there. We want to soar without waiting. The weight says we hang in there and we rest in God. I know God's faithful. I know he's strong and he knows everything. And God's concerned about us and he loves us. And he's for us, not against us. And we can rest in him. And we can hang in there and find his grace sufficient. And in the midst of the mess... God comforts us. My favorite verses on comfort from Isaiah 40 is verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. Aren't those precious words? We have a few minutes questions. I'll repeat the questions, just shout them out, and yeah. Okay, the other hostages, there were like 30 of us taken that day. They were all Filipinos except three Americans, me and Martin, and a businessman from California, but he was Peruvian. He'd only been an American citizen just a, f a week or so. Um, so they were all other Filipinos, and of course the wealthy people got ransomed right away. They got on the sat phones and the cell phones, and they told their loved ones, we need this much money, and they told them what bank account to put them in, and um, one by one, they all went home, and after five months, it was me and Martin and a Filipino nurse. I'm sorry to say, about two weeks into our captivity, they beheaded the other American. They just got upset about things. Um, so we started praying for a ransom, and I told Martin, how can we do that? When these are bad guys, we don't want them to have money. And Martin said, well, seems like to me they were asking a million dollars for Martin. His companion, that would be me, was free. Women have no value. But Martin said, it seems to me if we can trust God for a million dollars, we can trust that not a single 
weapon is bought with that million dollars, that it just trickles through their hands. And we started praying for someone to pay a ransom for us. And they did. At almost the year mark, a wealthy businessman in Dallas, oh, uh, his name's Ross Perot. You older generation, you know Ross Perot, right? Uh, the younger generation wouldn't. He, um, he has gone to be with the Lord now. He, he knew Jesus. Um, he paid a ransom for us. And I remember the excitement when some of the money came into camp. This was it. We could all go home. And the leaders sat down, had a big meeting, and they called Martin and me over, and we sat on the dirt with them. They said, someone's paid a ransom for you, but we've decided it's not enough, and we're going to ask for more. And I begged them not to do that. I said, this is not going to turn out well. We are sick of this. You're sick of this. Take the money, and let's go home. But they were greedy. And they asked for more money. Well, you can imagine how defeated I felt that night when we lay down on our rice sacks to try to get some rest. And just as I was drifting off, Martin kind of nudged me, and he said, Gracia, I'm so glad that when Jesus paid a ransom for us, it was enough. Such wise words. He just took me from the depths and showed me the Lord, right? You're looking at your problem, and it's huge. And all of a sudden, someone brings the Lord that, you know, when Jesus paid a ransom for us, it was enough. Our main problem is taken care of. And um, I love that about Martin. He was always saying very wise things. Hope that answered your question. Anybody else? Mm. Mm. When I got rescued, was it because of a gunfight or, or a ransom? Um, you know, um, who would have ever thought that this would last for a whole year? And um, what we didn't know was the guys on the outside, the CIA, had sewn a homing device into a backpack that they sent into Sabaya one of the leaders of the group. And um, so they were able, with the spy planes and everything, to know what area we were in. They were closing in on us. Of course, we didn't know that. Um, so one morning, we hadn't eaten in 10 days. I didn't know you could go that long without food. I thought you go three days and you drop dead, but you don't. Um, we had salt and water. And um, one morning, up on the ridge, we heard six bys, uh, six by sixes, you know, those flat, flat bed trucks, and we knew they were soldiers and realized that they had found us. So we started moving that day. We found food, unripe fruit, nanka. Uh, they call it jackfruit, maybe, here in the United States unripe fruit, and we just gorged ourselves with it and kept walking. And, and I told Martin, um, I, I don't know how much longer I can do this. And he, he said, you know, just, just keep going. I think we're going to get to go home. And um, right about noon, it was clouding up to rain. And always before, there were certain unwritten rules between the Abu Sayyaf and the military. You know, they never had gun battles at night. They never fought in the rain. There were rules. And so we thought we were safe. It was clouding up to rain, and we set up our hammocks and our plastic sheeting that would shed the water and laid down for a rest. And um, Martin said to me, Gracia, I've been thinking about Psalm 100 all day long, especially that first verse that says, Serve the Lord with gladness. He said, This does not seem like serving the Lord. We've been walking through this jungle for over a year. But let's, by faith, accept that that's what we're doing here, that we're serving the Lord here, and let's do it with gladness. We laid down for a rest. The military came over the hill. They didn't stop for the rain. They pressed on, and they saw our camp and just opened fire on us. And I immediately was shot in the leg. Um, I rolled from the hammock and came to rest beside Martin. 
and I looked over at him and he was bleeding from his chest and you know I knew from experience leg wounds might might heal chest wounds don't and I just laid and and I was watching him die but but I didn't even know and all of a sudden he got very heavy have you heard that term the weight of death yeah and um, I don't know how long that gun battle lasted and then the Abu Sayyaf began retreating down the river and um, I could hear the soldiers coming down the hill so I started to move my hands around very slowly so I, I didn't want to startle them and get shot myself and and they saw I was alive and they came and dragged me up to the top of the hill and um, called a helicopter and um, it took me out of there and it's like I had Martin's last words to me serve the Lord with gladness it's my new life's theme I'm gonna do what God gives me to do I'm gonna do it with my whole heart and I'm gonna do it with gladness yeah thanks you guys <laughs>